Okay, well, I'll, um, I'll just give a brief introduction, um, Mary Odson. Um, Dr. Odson is an Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Akureyri. I hope I pronounced that okay, in Iceland. And he's a, currently a visiting senior fellow in the Department of Sociology, but due to go back home tomorrow. So we're very grateful um, to Gumi for coming along and speaking to us today about his work, which focuses on class awareness, class identities, class imagery, and perceptions of class division using mixed methods. And Dr. Dodson is going to speak today about his article, Class in Iceland, which is um, seen to be published in the journal Current Sociology. And um, so if you'd like to ask a question at the end, please raise your little virtual hand. And thanks for coming. And now I'll hand over to Gumi. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very honored to be talking here and uh, really enjoyed my time. Uh, as a visiting senior fellow here at, uh, at London. I, I really appreciate you know, everything that Laura and Ella and Andy, Mike uh, has, ha have done for me. So uh, uh, today I will be uh, talking about, so, so like mostly this upcoming uh, review article that I have in current sociology, but, I, but I'll also use that to sort of like lead into my ongoing uh, research. Uh, the picture that you have up here of Iceland, I just wanted to point out where I am located in the University of Akureyri up in the Northeast. You know, Reykjavik is in the Southwest. That's where two thirds of the population live. Uh, I'm up in, uh, in Akureyri, we're sort of like Iceland's second city. It's the beautiful part of Iceland. I sometimes kid with people. <laughs> so um, yes, and hopefully, you know, we'll have good discussions uh, at the end. So I won't be doing a lot of deep dives. I'll be telling you you know, a little bit about, you know, many things relating to class research uh, in Iceland. Uh, but towards the end, I'll do, uh, you know, deep dives if, uh, if we have uh, time. So just to set the stage, you know, Iceland is one of the Nordic countries, obviously, it's a social democratic uh, welfare state. It's a small country, you know, it's one uh, only has a, a population of uh, 376,000. Uh, we got on the news in 2008 because we experienced the, the biggest uh, economic collapse per capita in modern economic history. And this actually, uh, you know, connected Iceland and the UK because you put a terrorist law on us to, you know, to secure British deposits in Icelandic banks. Uh, but we, you know, got you back in 2016 when we uh, knocked you out of the euro uh, 2016 uh, in football. Uh, Iceland uh, has, joy, has enjoyed a speedy economic recovery after becoming the first uh, country to get IMF, an IMF bailout in 30 years. And now Iceland is actually back, you know, sort of like where it was uh, in, you know, just before the collapse. Um, when the collapse uh, happened in 2008. Iceland was ranked number one on the Human Development Index, um, and now it's at number four. Um, Iceland, uh, you know, you know, ranks you know quite high on these like quality of life like indices. You know, uh, on the World Economic Forum, it's been like number one when it comes to the gender gap index for like the last 13 years running. Uh, it's considered to be the most peaceful country in the world. Uh, so in, in many respects, Iceland, you know, you know, boxes, you know, above its weight, you know, uh, in, uh, in that sense. Uh, so I mostly, I consider myself a class analyst. So about 90% of the research that I do involve some type of a class an class analysis. And I mostly focus on the subjective dimensions of class. I also do like research on social control and deviance and mostly focusing on, you know, police students uh, and rural police officers. Uh, but what I've mostly been studying over the last 12 years is class awareness. Okay, so not so much, like, not so much so like the objective dimensions of class, but more like, you know, how people think about class. And here's just a, one of the many definitions of class awareness uh, from Scott and Marshall. Um, so 
if I would have to describe my research program, I would argue that it's a, you know, a, a multifaceted investigation of class awareness and social change. Okay. Uh, and so theories about social change, you know, led me to, uh, you know, so like think about Iceland in the grand scheme of things and so like social change in late modernity and when we're talking about theories of uh, social change uh, or recent social change you have to engage with the individualization uh, thesis and here is a, a, a let's say a descriptive quote from from Beck you know uh, because a big part of the individualization argument is that uh, late modern social changes have undermined class, not only the objective uh, dimension, but also the subjective uh, dimension. So, so this is sort of what I've been doing over the last 12 years is to investigate, you know, you know, Iceland uh, from, this, um, from this vantage point. And I just told Mike uh, last week that uh, when I read his uh, class analysis and social transformation book as a grad student, it opened my eyes and sort of like helped set me uh, on this course. Okay, um, so today I wanted to talk about uh, Icelandic class research uh, based on this article that is forthcoming in, in current sociology. And it's going to be organized around these uh, five themes, class structure, politics, inequality, awareness, and culture leading into my uh, ongoing research. So uh, theories of socio of sociocultural change hold that class awareness in Western societies has declined as taken for granted identities break down alongside the class structure that once sustained them. And individualization theorists like uh, Giddens, Beck, Bauman, they argue this case most convinc convincingly arguing that the st structural and cultural changes of late modernity have undermined class relations that generated awareness and identities in early modernity. And instead they argue that individualization compels people to be reflexive and perceive themselves as individuals rather than as members of collectivities like classes, okay? So here they're arguing like why, you know, we see so like, you know, the, the fizzling away of the labor movement, et cetera. So um, my review of class research in Iceland uh, since the dawn of modernization, and I argue that the dawn, dawn of modernization in Iceland is, you know, around uh, the year 1900, because, you know, uh, the first wave of industrialization in Iceland didn't happen until 1902, with when the first boat was mechanized, so that was sort of like the first wave of modernization. Uh, I, I sometimes argue that Icelanders were late, usually late to the party, but when we join the party, we party harder than everyone else. <laughs> so, so when it comes to modernization, it started late, but it happened quite fast. When it came to neoliberal globalization, it happened late, and, but it happened very fast. So, and you can mention a few other uh, things like this. So my review article uh, shows that contrary to the individualization thesis, that class relations, although transformed, continue to structure inequality in late modern Iceland and that neoliberal globalization has increased class awareness. So Icelanders are more class aware today in the 2020s than they were in the 1990s or the 1970s, okay? However, and remember Iceland is a social democratic welfare state, class division in Iceland is, tip is typically not very pronounced by international comparison. And this is, of course, explained by Iceland's social democratic welfare system moderating class inequality. Okay. You know, we have a progressive tax system, uh, you know, uh, and, and various types of universal welfare programs that, you know, raise the baseline of inequality. Uh, in some respects, class relations have become less collective. Uh, but as uh, Mike uh, argues and more, you know, individualized class identities and imagery can coexist with individualization. So individualization, you know, doesn't dissolve class, okay? It just sort of like reconfigures it, okay? And uh, so like the main argument that I make um, is that I argue that the, the strength and the trajectory of class awareness in late modernity uh, varies by welfare regime, okay? 
Uh, and I argue that class theorists in general overgeneralize declining class awareness based on di highly differentiated liberal welfare states. You know, most studies of class are, of course, uh, conducted here in the UK or in the US, which are liberal welfare states. And I argue that we sort of like overgeneralize their experience, you know, you know, you know, too much. And I argue that we need to, you know, uh, take into account the possible different trajectories based on uh, welfare regimes. So uh, looking at Iceland uh, as sort of like a, almost like a prototypical social democratic welfare state, uh, Iceland was arguably the most egalitarian modern democracy since gaining independence in 1944 until the mid 1990s, okay? However, in the 90s, uh, Iceland's government embarked on neoliberal reforms uh, that significantly increased income inequality and concentrated wealth. Uh, and this neoliberal globalization was marked by the rise of transnational capitalists and the immigration of low wage foreign workers, which undermined taken for granted ideas of classlessness. And these uh, developments, uh, and here I, it bears noting that the OECD, you, you know, using their data, argues that no country exper has experienced a greater jump in economic inequality or income inequality over a shorter period of time than Iceland did from 1993 until 2007. There was a huge jump in the Gini coefficient. So these develop, developments uh, foreshadowed Iceland's economic collapse, which was the biggest financial crack, biggest financial crisis ever relative to economic size after the country's banking system imploded, okay? And uh, this generated the so-called pots and pan revolution in Iceland, uh, where people marched to the streets, it mobilized 25% of the population, and people were literally banging pots and pans, uh, arguing for the, uh, for the government to step down. And this swept Iceland's first um, leftist government into power in 2009. Uh, you know, you have to keep in mind that two thirds of the population live in Reykjavik. So mobilizing 25% of the population, yes, I know that it's impressive, but you have to remember that almost everyone lives, you know, where the parliament is, okay? So despite a lot of political turmoil since, there, you know, there were, there were series of, of, um, uh, uh, of protests, large-scale mass protests uh, following the collapse. So despite this political turm turmoil and Iceland becoming the first industrialized country in 30 years to receive an IMF bailout, I Iceland has recovered relatively quickly due to government action and increased fish catch and a tourist boom, okay? So I argue that Iceland offers a microcosm, so like, a, like a micro world uh, to study uh, class uh, uh, and 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 you see you know a lot of movement you know Iceland enjoyed this boom then a bust and then a quick re recovery and I argue that this offers a really interesting case uh, even a, like a comparative case for for uh, class analysis and I argue that you know class analysis uh, typically study diverse and very class ridden societies However, our examining relatively homogenous and less differentiated societies can offer new understandings, okay? So um, I wanted to start by focusing on class structure, okay? So if we look at Iceland starting in the early uh, 1900s, uh, we can see, and here I'm gonna show you, uh, this is a descriptive class model showing, you know, the, the size of different classes, the middle class, the working class, and the upper class over a hundred year period, you know, across the, across the uh, 20th century. So a modern Icelandic class structure emerged around the turn of the 20th century as advances in the fishing industry fueled industrialization and urbanization, capitalist development and proletarianization, okay? Referring to the fundamental change in labor relations brought by the emergence of a capitalist society where more laborers become dependent on the market for their livelihood, okay? That's what we're seeing at the beginning uh, of the 20th century, okay? 
These developments, of course, created the conditions for class-based organizations like political parties, unions, employer associations. And all of these things are happening in the, in the first uh, decades of the 20th century. Uh, you know, political parties being formed and, and huge waves of unionization, okay? So at the beginning of the 20th century, Iceland was one of Western Europe's most impoverished countries. It was very, and it was even quite poor, static, and isolated at the start of World War II. However, Iceland was probably the only European country that had a stronger economy after World War II than before World War II. That was because the war ushered in the second wave of industrialization. Uh, and Iceland's wartime economy boomed as fish prices climbed, and we had a, 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 uh, an occupying force from the United States that invested very heavily, built infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And post post World War II economic growth, increased in employment and welfare state expansion fueled a lot of social mobility and middle class growth and increased affluence. And that's what this picture is showing us. You know, the middle class grew very fast, especially in the decades following, uh, following uh, World War II. And here we also see so like the welfare state integration of the working class. And this modified the class structure by so like raising the baseline of class inequality and extending social citizenship. You know, you see, you know, the welfare state expand, you, you see public education expanding, and a, a lot of people from the working class have a, a better uh, you know, th there's more room at the top, or at least room in the middle. The, the middle class is, is, is swelling, okay? So uh, there's like a mobility updraft. So uh, when individualization theorists, you know, look at data like this, you know, we see the growth of the middle class and, 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 and these changes, you know, the welfare state in integration, you know, they argue and, and interpret these changes as reflecting sort of like the end or of class divisions. However, while the Icelandic class structure has changed since the beginning uh, or the middle of the 20th century, uh, we still have very marked divisions in terms of resources, opportunities, and risk, okay? The sharpest division is, of course, between the capitalists and the wage earners, but there are still significant differences among the latter, meaning the wage earners, okay? And when we factor in, um, when we factor in uh, capital gains and wealth, we see even dr more drastic uh, uh, differences. For, for example, if you look at the top 10% of income earners in Iceland, they earn almost 10 times what the poorest earn, okay? And if we look to the 5% or the 1%, it of course becomes uh, more, uh, more uh, extensive. However, these changes that you're seeing here uh, have also blurred the traditional working and middle class divide, okay? And this is reflected in the fact that the traditional middle class, meaning non-manual workers, has in recent decades become polarized between university educated professionals on the one hand and unskilled service workers on the other, okay? Which of course, some people argue are the new working class, okay? So, uh, but, so contrary, to the individualization, individualization claim that neoliberalization has dissolved class, okay? We see that the most significant surge in class inequality in Iceland transpired during Iceland's neoliberal ascendancy from the mid-90s uh, mid, mid, uh, up until the economic collapse. It fueled a debt-driven economic boom. And keep in mind that the stock market, the Icelandic stock market multiplied ninefold between 2001 and 2007, and Iceland's banks outgrew the Icelandic economy by a factor of 10, okay? So Iceland was, you know, it was a powder keg just waiting to uh, explode, okay? Uh, and here uh, on the screen, you see uh, uh, one of uh, the Iceland's foremost neoliberal ideologues describing Icelandic, uh, Iceland's neoliberal experiment. And he favorably talks about neoliberal reforms in Thatcher's Britain, New Zealand, and Pinochet's Chile. Uh, and three years later, or four years later, uh, after this appeared in the Wall Street Journal, of course, the bubble burst. And Arthur Laffer even said a few months before the collapse that Iceland should be a model for the world, you know, during this neoliberal experiment. Uh, but what happened, of course, during this time is 
the the class system transforms but instead of show instead of being about so like the growth of the middle class we see a rise of uh this transnational capitalist class okay and this is happening uh, you know uh mainly before the economic collapse but has continued uh albeit at a slower pace uh since so, uh, but at the other end of the class structure, uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, low wage foreign workers uh, enter the workforce. Uh, and between 1996 and 2018, the, the immigrant part of the Icelandic population rose from being less than 2% of the population to be more than 14%. Okay. And these immigrants are disproportionately found in unskilled work and in the ranks of the precariat, which uh, uh, Mike has defined as people who struggle to get by on a daily basis okay or described uh and despite despite you know these claims that uh the neoliberal uh labor market has democratized democratized risk uh we see that unskilled workers in iceland are 10 to 20 times more likely to be unemployed than professionals and managers and their concentration in precarious work has amplified Iceland's most fundamental class divide that dif differentiates uh, wealthy transnational capitalists from the precariat. And a defining feature is that the precariat, they have very little access to owner-occupied housing, okay? And they are seven times more likely to rent, you know, in the bottom quintile than in the, in the, in the top quintile. And, and this is like the, the, the main class divide uh, today uh so and it's so like this increased polarization between the top and the bottom that is you know uh, uh that is like the most defining feature of uh, class relations uh in iceland uh today uh and of course uh you know the i you know it's not just iceland's class structure that has changed you know the the class structure of uh you know western societies has changed and here i just wanted to give you a, a snapshot using using daniel uh, Usch, this uh, uh class model to just give you a snapshot of what the icelandic uh, class structure looks like using this so like one of the most you know updated um, uh, class models uh today but uh turning to class politics uh without you know you can just read the definition yourself but uh in iceland as in elsewhere in in europe class politics peaked in western europe at the in the early 20th century okay and at that time we had uh four parties uh that uh re you know reflected different class interests uh that uh were founded were founded in the first decades of the 20th century and they sort of like reflected hardening class division as iceland's uh, capitalist uh economy was you know uh taking root okay and hardening class division at this time heightened working class consciousness and this is manifested in the fact that we had the birth of two working class parties we had the founding of the confederation of labor uh, we had a lot of unionization, and the 30s were the golden age of the working class movement. This is where the, the, the Icelandic working class movement uh, won their biggest battles, okay? And we still have laws today, you know, that are protecting workers that were won, you know, in 1938. 1938. So this is sometimes called the, the golden age of the Icelandic uh, uh, labor movement, okay? Uh, Western European class politics became less contentious and more corporate in the post-war era, okay? Uh, and individual decision theorists claim that this uh, has made pol political, uh, has made class divisions less politically relevant. However, Iceland has followed a different trajectory, okay? Because class conflict in Iceland and mobilization has remained strong uh, until today. And Icelandic unions have become very powerful. And today, Iceland actually has the highest unionization rate in the world, sitting at 90%, 9-0, okay? Widespread union support, uh, you know, it's in, the, it's, it's in the 80s and has among the OECD's highest strike rates, okay? 
So what the Icelandic labor movement has made up for its lack of formal political strength with other forms of class mobilization. So in the other Nordic countries, like in Sweden, for example, the, the labor movement is stronger politically. It's, it's better represented by the, the, the formal parties. It's less so in Iceland, but here, you know, uh, you know, it has used other, other uh, avenues, uh, which has helped Iceland keep up with Nordic social development. And in recent years, the labor movement has actually become uh, more contentious uh, and has increasingly mobilized uh, immigrant workers and the precariat. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I. So in some respects, uh, uh, Iceland is, is different from what we're seeing, you know, uh, where you see like de-unionization de in, in some other countries. Iceland has actually, you know, held its own and if anything is, is moving up. So, uh, uh, and, and if we look at like other forms of political mobilization, we see that mass protests against economic injustice in post-collapse Iceland also has, have a distinct class basis. Uh, uh, so, you know, class mobilization in Iceland uh, is, is, is going strong, okay? But if we look at electoral politics, you know, the picture is a little different, okay? We see that class voting was very strong in Iceland in the, in the middle of the 20th century, but has since weakened, okay? Uh, but we do see a rise in class voting um, following the economic uh, collapse. It's not as... It's, not nearly as strong as, as it was in the 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century, but we still see that class structures, you know, uh, political behavior uh, uh, in Iceland. Um, sorry, uh, but I wanted to mention one thing on the class politics uh, before we move on. So we can see, so like the continuing effects of class on political participation uh, especially strong when we look at elected representatives, okay? Uh, three years ago, a book was published uh, that analyzes the background of the people that sit in our parliament, okay? And it demonstrates that uh, members of parliament come predominantly from what the author terms the upper class or 63%. And this number far exceeds the other Nordic countries. There you see between 15 and 20, Okay, and uh, the author Arthurson argues that it's you know almost three times that uh, in Iceland, and and he argues that uh, that the data undoubtedly suggests that the political elite in Iceland is partly rooted in family ties, and that certain families defend their positions similar to the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. Okay, so uh, this was quite a boom, you know, when the when these uh, you know, results uh, came out. So moving to uh, class inequality, um, here I'm just referring to the extent to which uh, resources are unevenly distributed. Uh, if we take a, so like a long perspective on Iceland, if you look at the beginning of the 20, 20th century, income was very unequally distributed, okay? In 1927, the top 10% of the uh, income distribution uh, garnered 42% of all the income. And the Gini coefficient was 0.56, which is very high, okay? Uh, economic inequality declined significantly in the post-war era, okay? And, and, and a case could be made that from 1944 until 1995, Iceland was the most uh, egalitarian country in the world when it comes to uh, economic inequality, okay? Meaning that the Gini coefficient was low and the Gini coefficient also for wealth inequality uh, was low, okay? Uh, however, uh, uh, however, uh, things changed in the middle of the, in, in the mid 1990s, okay? Between 1993 and 2007, the, the share that the top 1% uh, of, of families uh, took home from the national income swelled from 4% to 20%, okay? And the Gini coefficient for disposable income soared from 0.26 to 0.44. This is what the OECD refers to as the biggest increase uh, in, 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 in income inequality out of any OECD country ever, okay? 
And, uh, and this uh, sort of like surging inequality coincided, of course, with the usual suspect, deregulation, privatization, and tax cuts for corporations and the wealthy. And of course, this was implemented by a conservative-led government that took uh, office in 1995. That same year, Iceland joined the European Economic Area, which mean, means that, that it accesses UE, uh, the, the EU's free movement of goods, labor, services, and capital. Okay, And this marked Iceland's entry into globalized finance, which for, uh, foreshadowed the, the economic collapse. Iceland essentially just went on a spending spree uh, because we had all this you know, borrowed uh, capital. Okay. And uh, here you can read this uh, is from a, 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 an art exhibit in my in my hometown, literally five months before the collapse. And they and they were trying to capture the changes that had happened in Iceland over a short period of time. I'm not going to read this. You can read this yourself. Uh, but the most striking manifestation of rising inequality in Iceland due, due to neoliberal globalization and this departure from an egalitarian base was the formation of a transnational capitalist class and a precariat that was disproportionately constituted by immigrants. Okay? And in fundamental respects, I argue that these groups, these two groups uh, from different vantage points stand outside what T.H. Marshall referred to as the common national experience and the class fusion that the welfare system facilitates. Uh, specifically, the transnational capitalists are in what I argue are supra citizens who, in addition to their uh, full social citizenship, can draw on their flexible citizenship uh, and enhance their ample stocks of capital uh, at home and abroad. Okay. Immigrants, on the other hand, are quote unquote sub citizens who either lack full citizenship rights or they don't have the cultural, social, or economic capital to reap the full benefits of social citizenship, okay? And here we get to the crux of my argument. I argue that while liberal and conservative welfare regimes have long had these cultural and economic outgroups at the bottom and top of the class structure, these groups were virtually absent in social democratic societies before the onset of neoliberal globalization. So I, I argue that neoliberal globalization signals a much more significant shift for social democratic welfare states than for other welfare regimes. Okay, and and I, you know, uh, so sort of like argue this more uh, in more detail in this article here uh, that I, you know, you can look up for yourself. So, uh, you know, uh, looking at I see that, and I'm running short of time, so I'm just gonna so like skip this. But, but just argue that uh, you know studies do show that social mobility is quite high in Iceland. It's on par with the other high mobility countries like Denmark and Sweden, uh, Norway, and, uh, and 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 Finland. Uh, but but uh, uh, but. Icelanders still believe in, you know, opportunity barriers and what they argue, uh, you know, matters greatly for social mobility in Iceland is knowing the right people. OK, and this might have to do with the fact that, uh, you know, Iceland is only a country of 376,000 people. OK, and, you know, so the, deg the degrees of, uh, you know, separation are are not six, you know, they're probably three or four. All okay? right. But. Moving on, you know, and I argue this, you know, in more detail in this article uh, right here. So moving on to uh, class awareness. Okay. So uh, as you know from Giddens and Michael Mann, there are of course levels of class consciousness. Okay, with class awareness being so sort of like the most emergent form of class awareness. At the top, you know, of class consciousness, we have social behavior organized around the active pursuit of class interest, you know, when the forming of, you know, political parties and unions and even a revolution, okay, a revolutionary class consciousness. So the, the levels range from, you know, individual class identity to advanced group uh, consciousness. Uh, working class consciousness in Iceland uh, grew significantly in the early 20th century. And this manifested in increased mobilization, rapid unionization, the confederation of labor, workers' parties, and intensified class conflicts. Okay, uh, this 
uh, class consciousness decline in the decades following uh, uh, World War II as class differences decreased, mobility increased, and taken for granted ideas of relative classlessness took root. I term this classlessness as doxa, and I define it as the largely unquestioned assumption that contemporary Iceland is a relatively classless society, therefore having little class division to speak of. Okay? And I argue that this became fundamental to the national habitus uh, in the latter half of the 20th century. So this is where this idea that Iceland is relatively classless uh, takes root uh, uh, in the Icelandic uh, national habitus. Okay? Uh, however, uh, and, you know, and, and studies you know, that were conducted in the 70s and 80s suggest that Icelanders had relatively weak class awareness. However, uh, things uh, changed you know, after e uh, inequality started increasing in the, uh, in the mid 1990s, foreshadowing the collapse. There you see heightened uh, class awareness. Okay? And I analyzed uh, uh, class discourse in Iceland over uh, a 28 year period between 1986 and 2012. I, I studied it both uh, uh, at, in parliament, so parliamentary discussions over the same period, and also Iceland's leading newspaper that at the time had like an 80% readership, weekly readership, uh, and a 60% daily readership. So it was sort of like sort of like the national mirror uh, uh, at the time, and my analysis uh, shows that neoliberal globalization, particularly by increasing uh, economic inequality, eroded these uh, taken for granted ideas of relative classlessness and enhanced perceptions of class division during this neoliberal ascendancy leading up to the 2008 collapse. Okay, and class discourse increased significantly. Uh, you can see in the darkened era. There you have, you know, almost uh, 10 times more class discourse than in the pre-neoliberal ascendancy period. Uh, and, and it's not just about the quantity, it's also about, you know, you know, how people were talking about it. When people were talking about class division before the 1990s, they usually would hedge their claims, saying that, you know, Iceland was not as you know, class divided as something else. But during the, the neoliberal ascendancy period, people were making very, very strong claims. And it was very quite obvious that, you know, their uh, class awareness had been heightened, okay? Um, uh, I, you know, I was the first one to conduct uh, 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 a survey of the Icelandic population where I would field uh, subjective class identity questions. Uh, since then, we have fielded the International Social Survey Program many times in Iceland, so we have you know, better, uh, better data. But you know, to make a long story short, uh, a big part of, uh, like most Icelanders do see themselves as middle class. In fact, compared to 49 countries in the World Value Survey, Icelanders have a more middle class view of their class position than all but three countries. Oh, sorry, all but two countries. Uh, and I'm just mindful of time. So I'm just going to jump over to the last theme, which is class culture. Uh, here, you know, it's just one of a million definitions of, uh, uh, of what we mean by culture. And this is taken from uh, an Icelandic book about uh, the working class by the, uh, by, the, by the seaside called the hidden class, okay? So many claim that Iceland has a uniquely egalitarian culture, okay? And, Iceland, and studies do show that Icelanders strongly value equality, okay? And what was at the time the most comprehensive study of Iceland a sociological study of Iceland back in 1980, St Thomason claims that Icelanders' strongest cultural value is egalitarianism. And he argues that the roots of egalitarianism can be traced back to Iceland's settlement in 874 and argues that Iceland is the first new society. It's not the US or Australia or Canada, it's Iceland, because obviously Iceland is as much older than these, than these countries. But the new societies are believed to share a settler culture that stresses individualism, independence, and status equality. And he argued that as evidence of uh, cultural classlessness and minimal class awareness, 
Thomason argues that Icelanders don't, you know, show a very notable, noticeable lack of deference to other people. Uh, however, uh, Stefan Olason argues that this reflects weak status distinctions in Iceland, but not weak class awareness. And this could be maybe explained by the fact that Iceland is the world's oldest parliamentary democracy and the only European country that never had a formal uh, nobility. Okay. Um, but of course, uh, we saw alongside working class mobilization and the growth of the working class in the beginning, in the beginning of the 20th century, we saw the, the emergence of a working class culture that consisted of traditions, beliefs, and practices that were sort of like joined together by their experiences of wage labor. And this was a culture in opposition of, you know, the old agrarian uh, culture, but also the, sort of the capitalists, okay? Uh, then, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> uh, we had at, at, you know, after World War II, we have you know de declining class inequality and and this uh culture takes shape you know that um uh you know iceland becomes relatively egalitarian at least by international standards uh in economic inequality declines and and classlessness as doxa takes shape meaning you know taken for granted ideas you know start you know taking taking hold okay uh but again, neoliberal globalization undermines these uh, ideas. And this is a quite uh, descriptive comment by our former uh, Secretary of State. Uh, you know, and she is now, he is here describing, you know, how, these, how neoliberal globalization starting in the mid 1990s, you know, uh, leading up to the collapse, how it's like not only just undermined, uh, uh, you know, how it increased inequality, but also how it, you know, undermined uh, these ideas, these fundamental ideas about what it means to be uh, Icelandic, okay? So I'm just gonna skip this and just go straight to the conclusions, okay? So <clears throat> uh, this review of uh, class research in Iceland uh, since the dawn of modernization at the beginning of the 20th century shows that the persistence of class divisions. OK, uh, and we show we see this for other societies as well. OK, class analysis consistently demonstrate the persistence of class divisions in late modernity, but findings regarding class awareness have been less conclusive. And for many, including Mike, uh, there's a growing divergence between class inequality and class awareness. Uh, contrary to the individualization thesis of the demise of class, this review uh, shows that class divisions, albeit transformed, persist in late modern Iceland and have in some respects become more pronounced, okay? And moreover, neoliberal globalization heightened perceptions of class divisions and class awareness in general, which uh, contradicts claims that class awareness has declined across the board in late modernity. And these findings, I argue, support the argument that there are various pathways to late modernity including by different welfare regimes. So I am arguing that, that social democratic welfare states are following a different trajectory than liberal welfare regimes or conservative uh, welfare regimes, okay? And based on Iceland's case, I argue that the strength and trajectory of class awareness in late modernity vary by welfare regime and by extension that theorists overgeneralize declining class awareness based on highly differentiated liberal welfare states. So, uh, and this of course has implications for countries that are undergoing ne neoliberal globalization and highlights the need to adopt a more internationalist approach to the sociology of class. So I know that I have, you know, run out of time before I get to my ongoing research. So maybe, Ella, maybe, and Laura, maybe want to just go to the Q&A and I can maybe just, you know, uh, mention the ongoing research along the way. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much, Gimming. That was a really fascinating sort of potted history of of Icelandic society and politics. And I, I confess I knew very little about the country before that. So that was um, really enlightening. Thank you. Um, has anyone 
I've got a question. Has anyone else got a question first? A little hand up or just talk. <laughs> Marta. Laura, go for it. I'll ask uh, after you. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about the, the precariat, the immigrant labour. What, what, so if they if they become immigrants in such a strong social democratic welfare state, why are they still so precarious? Do they not have access to these to these welfare resources? Well, their access, you know, is let's say it's like it's gradated, okay? And even if and even if if they have access to it, you know, often you know the let's say the uh, you know, Icelanders talk Icelandic, okay? It's it's a, it's a notoriously difficult language to learn, okay? And uh, and often their let's say their ability to mobilize, you know, their resources is hampered by the fact that they so like lack this cultural capital to be able to 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 speak and uh, to 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 speak the language and you know and and even our biggest. Um, uh, the, the biggest part of the immigrant population actually comes from Poland, uh, you know, and I think we have almost 30,000 people, you know, from, from Poland. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of the stuff, you know, that they should be able to access, you know, is not in Polish, okay? You know, it's, it's only in English and it's not, you know, the fact that they all speak, I, that they all speak English. Uh, but and and also some of the for for some of the benefits you have to have stayed you know a certain amount of time in Iceland to be able to uh, uh, to to get them. Uh, no, but, that, but, but, that sounds very familiar. Yeah, yeah. And, and even you know if we think about like social rights, you know, uh, you know, like social social citizenship, the most important right, of course, would be you know the the right to vote. Okay, but they have to live in Iceland for a number of years because before they can obtain this fundamental right, you know, and even to, to be able to vote in municipal elections. And you, and you can imagine how, how uh, active people become if, you know, if there is like denied this right, you have to like live in Iceland for five years or something, you know, yeah. Sure. Marta, would you like to ask your question now? And then Victoria. Um, yes, um, it was a fantastic presentation. I, I particularly liked how you uh, connect the literature on the class structure with the awareness team. And, and I was wondering, yeah, if you could go a little bit in, more into detail of how you relate those two um, dimensions, but also if you go back to the your main findings, page uh, 27. Um, I think, yeah, I, yeah. I, I haven't, no, I think the, the graph, the- Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, I don't really uh, understand like yeah. how you measure here class awareness, like what is newspaper accounts and, and yes. when, you, when you measure the relationship and I, it's something that I struggle a lot with descriptive statistics too, is how do you measure sort of the effect of uh, economic crisis with them, um, like associated to awareness? Yes, yeah. well, thank you so much for asking that question. So um, in this paper, uh, I'm using both quantitative and qualitative analysis of class discourse, okay? And what we're seeing here is uh, accounts it, it, it means, you know, uh, like newspaper articles, editorials, you know, any, you know, a, one account is, you know, uh, like a newspaper item, okay? Uh, and, and here, and, and that, that's the bars, okay? And then the, the lines, you see the, the, the unbroken line and, and, and the broken line, that is the Gini coefficient uh, for disposable income, okay? And here, the, the correlation between the Gini coefficient and the, and the number of articles was uh, 0.56, okay? So, so, so there's a fairly strong uh, correlation uh, between, you know, as, as, uh, as uh, inequality increases, so does the number of 
of, of, of articles claiming that Iceland is class divided, okay? And even if I take out this huge one in 2006, which was uh, close to parliamentary elections, and people were, you know, fighting over, you know, you had the people on the left saying, you know, Iceland has never been more class divided. And then you have the people on the right saying, well, you know, what are you talking about? You know, look around you, look at Britain, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and even if I take that one out, you know, the correlation just drops to just under uh, 0.5, okay? Uh, and, but this is only, so like, the the quantity here i'm just just looking at the quantity uh here and of accounts where the where people are claiming iceland is class divided in one form or another okay and and there is a, a qualitative difference between the the period that is darker okay in the in the in the period that is darker there the number of uh, our accounts claiming that Iceland is class divided is like 30 per year, okay? In the one before, it's like 3.7 or something. So it's almost 10 times more articles claiming that Iceland is class divided in this, you know, what I call the neoliberal ascendancy period, okay? So as inequality is, is going up, you know, people obviously, you know, uh, are aware. And, and, and so it's, but of, of course, people don't, don't have the Gini coefficient on their phones. You know, they're not checking the Gini coefficient, but you know, but they're seeing newspaper, uh, uh, they're seeing newspaper uh, and media coverage. You know, in 1996, we had Iceland's first glossy magazine that created the category, the Fina of Fatlea Folke, meaning, you know, the fancy and the rich people, you know, and people were tracking, you know, the transnational capitalist class who were buying, apartments in the most expensive uh, street here in London, pinstripe jets, uh, penthouse apartments in New York and that type of stuff. So, uh, so uh, it, it, it didn't surprise me that we had this huge increase during this time because in some respect, Iceland just went nuts. You know, <laughs> we, were, we were just almost like trying to catch up with, uh, you know, catch up with the Joneses, meaning, you know, the other, the, uh, the other countries. Uh, but this is only the quantitative part. So what I did was then qualitatively uh, analyze the discourse both in parliament and in the media. And there you see not only an increase, but also just a complete you know, change in how people talk. People were making very strong claims. Even there was even a, a guy, an MP claiming in 2006, I, Iceland is the most class divided country in Europe, which of course makes no sense, but you know, but you know, but, but just imagine like no one would have dreamed to say this in the early nineties, let alone in the eighties. Okay. But, but, but yes, you know, uh, if, if you would read this article and give me your feedback on it, it would be great. Like this is one of the articles that, I, yeah. the, 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 one of the articles that I'm most proud of, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah. It's we're very similar research interests, so okay. I think we'll. Yeah, I will chat soon. Thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I think Victoria ha has her hand up. Yeah, thank you so much. It was fascinating. I was curious to hear a bit more about the um, role of the education system um, in kind of this, you know, whole class system. Like, you know, does it, is there kind of like a, is it very egalitarian? So kind of public schools that all have the same reputation or is there like a bit of a imbalance and hierarchy and, you know, that maybe structures uh, class early on? Yes, I think this is a, an excellent question. So the, the Icelandic education system played a huge role in when, when let's say, in, when class inequality decreased in the, in World War, after World War II. Because, you know, uh, a pub, you know uh, the public education system was like extended, you know, to the rest of the population. Okay, and to and to this day we have a public education system. So we have seven universities. I know it sounds a, ri a ridiculous amount for a country of three hundred sixty thousand people, but all but two of them are public. Okay, and in the public universities you don't have to pay uh, uh, tuition. You pay a registration fee, which is not, it's it's not high, uh, and and that is one of the things that you know 
you know, definitely contributes to equality. Okay. And it's one of the reasons why, why I was able to go to graduate school, you know, to, you know, to, to begin with, I, some, yeah, I, as you probably hear from my somewhat U.S. accent, you know, I sometimes would tell my students in the U.S., if I would have been born in the U.S., I might not even have had the chance to go to university, okay? But of course, you also have this, you know, the other side of the coin, how, I, how the education system contributes to inequality. So it's not like all the schools are considered, you know, equally good. So you do have these elite schools and, and you can see how, uh, how students choose the right schools, you know, uh, to sort of like, you know, it's sort of like trying to like maintain their and their parents' middle-class status, you know. So it, it that definitely matters whether you're going to, you know, Reykjavik Junior College or 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 Akureyri Junior College or some comprehensive college. You know, people m will not use the word class, but they will say all the words in the book, but not the dreaded C word. But you know, but you can definitely see there the sort of like the reproduction of class. And and uh, I didn't have a chance to get to this, but as income inequality was uh, was uh, increasing, you could see how how uh, parents of school children were moving and concentrating in certain school areas and how they were leaving behind, you know, people of immigrant descent. You know, it's almost like white flight, you know. Uh, uh, so, and, and so you see so like both concentrated advantage and concentrated disadvantage, you know, in schools. And this does, this does not go away quickly. You know, the Gini coefficient actually plummeted after Iceland's economic collapse, which is unusual, but something like residential segregation, that takes years and decades, you know, and, 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 and this is some of the things that we are struggling with, you know, today, you know, that we see this in the, in, uh, in the capital area. And this is through the mechanism of schooling. Yeah. Thank you. I was, I was going to ask as well if there's a sort of geographic mirror to the increasing class division. We have that very much in the UK, especially in London. Um, and you've kind of answered it there that the wealthier families congregating around the better schools. But, you know, is, is Reykjavik sort of split into different sort of class, class areas? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you could definitely see that, you, you know. And, and, and this study, you know, that I'm referring to, so like help, help, like bring that into light, you know, help, so like help to put numbers, you know, be, behind what a lot of people instinctively knew, okay? Uh, and, uh, and yeah, you, you definitely see this. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Has anyone else um, got any more questions before we wrap up? We're bang on half past now. Thank you so much, Gumi. That was um, fascinating. I've always wanted to go to Iceland, so it's good to know a bit more about it. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you have my email, and I, you know, I, I've lived so long in uh, in the states that I'm always helping people that want to come to Iceland. You know, give them tips on uh, uh, on where to go and you know the cheapest way to travel. So feel free to you know hit me up with. Uh, with questions and you know if anyone has like you know i'm always looking for people to you know collaborate with or even just you know bounce ideas off of so my emails are down there so if you have any questions you want to get copies of papers that you're not able to access you know through conventional means feel free to email me and uh thank you so much for showing up and uh yeah hope hope to see you all at future conferences and maybe when i pop in here you know later <laughs> thanks so much and safe travel tomorrow thank you thanks coming bye everyone bye, bye.